Good evening and welcome to Empower You. Could I ask everyone to please take a seat? It's good to have so many of you here tonight and welcome to those of you online as well. I don't know if we have anybody new, but I'll just tell you a little bit about Empower You. Empower You was founded in 2011 by Dan Reganal, who is also the founder and CEO of Frame USA. Dan's vision was to present free classes on a diverse number of topics topics that are meant to, excuse me, can't talk, enjoy, educate, and engage. All of our classes that are held in the studio are live streamed. So if you can't make it to a class, you can always watch it online. And if you can't watch it that night, it is posted on the website within a day or two after the class, so you can go back and watch it. We are a free university, but we do have expenses, so therefore we do pass our little red buckets towards the end of the class. Any donation that you feel you'd like to give is very much appreciated. We also welcome any feedbacks that you have on any of our classes, good, bad, and ugly. You can go to info at empoweruohio.org. We also appreciate any suggestions for future classes. Many of our classes do come from our participants. I'd also like, um, when we have questions during tonight, our speaker is going to take questions during her presentation. If you would just raise your hand and wait for someone to bring a microphone to you so that everyone in the studio can hear your question, and especially those online, we want to be able to hear the question as well. I want to go over a few of our classes that are coming up. Thursday night, we have medical marijuana. Dr. Will Sawyer will be here talking about medical marijuana, I guess the good and the bad of it. Um, not Medically, it might be a good thing. Otherwise, other than that, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what he has to say. Next Tuesday, we have Ohio gun law changes. Um, Attorney Sean Maloney will be here to tell us about the changes that are gonna happen in the state of Ohio or, or have already happened. I guess one of the things people need to realize is that um, state laws are not always the same as federal laws, and I think federal kind of takes precedent over the state laws. But he'll be talking about that. If he doesn't, then somebody should ask him. Um, after that class, that's next Tuesday, and then we don't have another class until the following Tuesday, and that class is going to be on uh, dementia. This class is especially for caregivers. And if you haven't experienced that, you might want to come to this class because you're only, you could only be a day or a week or a month away from being a caregiver to somebody. And our speaker is supposed to be very good about helping you know how to deal with those situations. Next, uh, we have a door prize to give away. We've got this plant over here, a peace lily. We asked Judge Russell if she had any ideas what would be a good door prize. And she suggested a plant. So the, the plant is kind of goes with tonight's theme. Um, it's kind of helping women get back into life. It's a new beginning, a new start. So that's what the peace lily rep represents. And we'll see if the judge can pick a lucky number. It's her fault if you don't win. Number 689 for the plant number 680 right here right here let's give her a round of applause and nancy brown congratulations nancy and from here i'll let dan reckon i'll take over thank you let's give our executive director betty overstreet a round of applause how's everybody doing tonight it's good to see you here, and um, it's good to see the Cartiers back for Empower You. And is it Leanne? Leanne is here on her spring break. Could you imagine that? Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> spring break, that's a big thing. I know what I would be do doing, but uh, so I gave you a pass out on this, um, on this article, Timely, in the Enquirer. It encapsulates two of our courses that are coming up. It encapsulates marijuana, medical marijuana is Thursday night, and it encapsulates what happens to your concealed carry permit if you've been prescribed marijuana. 
So it's, I, I thought I'd heard about that on the radio, wasn't really up to speed on it. I thought it was pretty interesting. That's why I gave you that pass out tonight. So hopefully Sean Maloney, our great um, um, gun advocate, will be able to explain that to us fully. So I wanted to introduce the team to you. We've got uh, our treasurer, Bill Roll, in the back eating popcorn. Let's give him a round of applause, please. And uh, we've got Jay, our producer, in the back. Let's give him a round of applause. And um, Jill Google, our operations manager, who doesn't get to come um, to a lot of these classes because she works so hard. She's in the back. Let's thank her. Um, so I love it. I love it when I get just out of the blue, people write me notes and stuff. And uh, we had this incredible session. Was it last Thursday night? on the Electoral College. If you haven't had a chance to, to, if you weren't here that night and you didn't see it, make sure you go online and watch it um, because it was powerful and people kind of walked away with stars in their eyes about the Electoral College. And this is what one of our readers wrote me and dropped it off today. I listened, not watched, to the Electoral College presentation. Outstanding. The part of the we the people was the fitting missing part of the jigsaw puzzle. Maybe it's that I'm older and cynical in the shallowness, should I say, of local and national leaders. I was impressed with how Mr. Mulherry described the maturity, genius, and devotion along with what must have been a large dose of mutual respect required of the participants um, to decide on the ideals, concepts, and details of the Constitution. Thanks for a, a reprieve from shaming, victimization, and virtual virtue signaling. So um, I thought that was really a kind of a cool, cool note from um, one of our participants. I really think we've got a great schedule this semester, um, but kind of off subject for just a minute. I was, I was actually sitting in church a couple weeks ago and um, it was that night sat, it was a Saturday night. Do you remember when the rain came down? Like, it, like you never could imagine and the pastor, Pastor Rob over at the vineyard over in Springdale, um, you know, made a comment about global warming or climate change. Just like, you know, it's like people kind of make comments just kind of automatically. And I think we all should do great things to improve our environment. But I just had this vision in my mind that I wasn't sure that anybody that could create a planet as incredible as this could allow people to kind of destroy it. And it was the next day in the Sunday paper that Walter Williams kind of put in perspective what I was thinking. He's a lot smarter than I am ever. And um, this is what he said for those of you who didn't see it. And I'll, I've got this to pass out at the end. When you walk out, Bill Roll will give you one of these if you're interested in reading it. This is just a paragraph of what Walter Williams said. Our so-called fragile earth survived catastrophic events such as the floods in China in 1887, which took an estimated, imagine this, one to two million lives, followed by floods there in 1931, which took an estimated one million to four million lives. What about the impact of earthquakes on our fragile earth? Chile's 1960 earthquake was 9.5 on the Richter scale. It created a force equivalent to a thousand at atomic bombs going off simultaneously at the same time. The deadly 1656 earthquake in China's province devastated an area of 520 square miles. It is the height of arrogance to think that mankind can make any significant changes in the earth or can match nature's destructive forces. Our planet is not fragile. That's what Walter Williams had to say about um, climate change. I'm sorry we didn't have a class on that. We will next semester for sure. Another thing we're gonna be looking at um, as we start our anniversary series, I think we've got four classes on anniversaries. The first one of those is on April 15th, tax day. And that will be the 10 year anniversary of the Tea Party. And the theme of that session will be, um, what did the Tea Party accomplish? What is left to be accomplished? Well, surely the largest thing that the Tea Party didn't accomplish is any significant reduction in our federal debt. Despite how hard so many people tried, really it's worse than it's ever been under a bunch of Republicans. And uh, we'll be talking about that over the next couple classes to some degree. And I hope to educate you some on 
the whole federal debt problem. But tonight, what could be more empowering than talking about um, than talking about the subject we're going to talk about tonight with Judge Russell? Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a 1980 Miami University of Ohio graduate, 1983 University of Cincinnati College of Law, Urban Morgan Institute of International Human Rights Fellow. In 2014, she, it was created and, and she's the currently presiding over the Change Court, an Ohio Supreme Court certified specialty court for sex trafficking victims. From 2011 to 2016, Chief Justice O'Connor appointing, oh, she was appointed by Chief Justice O'Connor of the Ohio Supreme Court. She's won all sorts of awards, which uh, are many, and um, she's been married since 1985, and she's a mother of two grown sons. So it, did any of you hear her on the radio this morning? She was great. Welcome to Judge Russell. Come on up. Let's give her a round of applause. And welcome to everybody online tonight. We're glad to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the warm welcome. That 1980 Miami makes me laugh because there are people here today that really can vouch for that, that I really did graduate from 1980 in Miami, at Miami. But um, that's the great thing about Cincinnati, right? We're a small town. So thanks for being here. And then there's that person who's been with me since 1980 and through law school and all that good stuff. So thanks for having me. Um, thanks for your interest in um, human trafficking that occurs here in little old Cincinnati. Um, so I'm going to explain a few things to you. I'm going to explain to you how the court began. It's kind of an interesting story about how it began. Um, I might go out of order a little bit on the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and I, I said I would take questions during my presentation because this isn't the kind of class where you need to learn the information to get a grade. Um, it's to inform you about what it is that you want to know. So I'd much rather answer the questions that you have than necessarily stick on topic on script. So that's why if you have questions along the way, let me know. I'd, I'd much rather answer those questions if I'm able to. So um, change court, you can see the change sign there. Change court is um, changing habits and setting new goals is empowering. That's what it stands for. You really have to work hard to, to make that work, but it will work. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what the starfish um, symbol is for our change court, and that comes from the story of the starfish, which um, I didn't create it, but I, we kind of adopted it. And that story is um, there's an older man walking along the shore, and the tide is washing in and washing out, and he's walking along the sand along the beach, and he sees the starfish, and as he sees them, he throws them way back deep into the sea, kind of like a quarterback throw. And there's a young person walking towards him, and that young person says to the old man, old man, why are you bothering to throw those starfish back into the sea? The tide's just going to wash them up again, and they're probably going to die. Why are you wasting your efforts? And the old man picked one up and threw it into the sea and said, not this one, not today. So that's kind of um, the starting point for what we try and do in change court. And I will, so that's something to know. Um, so I'm going to put different pieces of change court together for you. I'm going to try and stick with my, um, with my outline and kind of not, because the first thing I'm going to do is, I think it's an interesting story to tell you how the program began. So in 2014, two Cincinnati police officers, vice officers, asked to speak to me privately, which is kind of unusual. And um, they, they got to sit down with me and they said, Judge, um, we've got a problem on West McMicken Avenue. It's an area sort of at the bottom of Clifton, runs parallel to I-75. There's a lot of prostitution going on there. Well, known this for a long time. I mean, everyone knew this in the, around the courthouse. But he said the people of the West McMicken Community Council are concerned. They want their neighborhood back. They want the garbage gone, the graffiti gone, the condoms gone, the syringes gone, the traffic gone. Uh, they want this out of their neighborhood. And they've come to Cincinnati City Council to ask for something to be done. And City Council has come to us to ask us to help. Because it's a crime problem, but it's a community problem. 
And oh, by the way, the citizens in this community council and the police, we recognize not only is it crime, but the people committing that crime are somebody, they're somebody's daughter and they're somebody's mother and nothing ever happens for this population. They are the, an underserved population in our community. So <clears throat> the one officer is very good at talking. The other officer is a really good at critical thinking. So she had been working and uh, the two of them had come together to present a program to me. They wanted one judge, there's 14 municipal court judges, and they wanted one judge to hear all the prostitution related cases in Hamilton County. They wanted it to be a woman. They wanted um, someone to create a program to pull these women off the streets um, with compassion, but with some kind of firm structure. And oh, by the way, they wanted me. And I was very humbled. And as they talked, they didn't know it, but I knew they were describing something called a specialty court. And I knew what that was because at that time I, had, I was presiding over a mental health specialty court. So now I'm gonna take you on a detour and tell you what a specialty court is. See, it's up there, but I'm going out of order. So when we come to that in the outline, you're like, oh yeah, we know that already. So a specialty court comes under the auspices of the Ohio Supreme Court. The very first specialty court in Ohio was right here in Hamilton County, created in 1991. So Ohio has a long history of offering specialty courts, which are treatment-based, restorative justice-based programs. And um, it was drug court, it was a drug court, the first drug court in Ohio, the first specialty court in Ohio. And since then, many uh, specialty courts have sprung up all over the 88 counties in Ohio. Uh, in Hamilton County, in, for adults, I can tell you, we have two mental health court dockets for felonies. We have two for the misdemeanor level where I am. We have a vet's court in a, the felony docket and the municipal court docket, and we have that drug court. So um, change court was, is, is one of those now. Uh, and there are many, many, um, they call them standards. The Ohio Supreme Court wants consistency throughout the 88 counties in Ohio so that if a judge is holding themselves out as a specialty docket, that means that a judge, in this case me, I have met, at this point, there are 77 standards that they want, the Supreme Court wants to see in my processes for treating people who come into my court. Some of them are pretty, um, Logical, pretty straightforward. Um, a person has to plead guilty. A person has to have a pending charge because it's ultimately, it's a condition of probation. They're in intensive supervision probation. Uh, the court, the judge has to assemble a team of treatment providers because it's a treatment-based court. So I have to have dedicated treatment providers at my treatment table whenever we meet. Uh, I have to have a prosecutor, a defense lawyer there. I have to have the probation department involved. Um, I have to have the other judges in the court agreeing to it because at some point they are going to be asked to transfer cases to my docket because there's 14 of us. So our cases get randomly assigned over 14 of us. But if I'm going to hear all the prostitution related cases, the judges have to agree to allow that. Um, the Supreme Court wanted to make sure I was looking at poverty. So in other words, don't give them very high fines, the people in my program when they're on probation, because you're going to set them up for failure if you're ordering them to pay a lot of money and they don't have the ability to pay. Um, the last sticking point, the last of the 77 values um, that I, I needed to hold up, I was held up before I could get the certification, was a drug testing. So Hamilton County adult probation had random drug testing, um, but the Supreme Court wanted it changed so that people in my program will be um, randomly drug tested with urine drops at a minimum of twice weekly and has to be frequent, random, and observed. So I had to get all the service providers who eventually agreed to come into this program with me to change all their internal policies on urine testing to come into compliance with what the Ohio Supreme Court got. 
So a lot of things going on, um, but I knew what a specialty court was. And I told the officers, you're describing a specialty court. And they looked at me like, what, what? Well, I've explained to them what I've explained to you. And they're like, okay, whatever it is, that's what we want. Well, I was intrigued uh, because like you, uh, the officers were telling me currently all the prostituted people in Hamilton County are also in addiction. So we never know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Were they addicted first and then they're selling their bodies to pay for their addiction? Or were they in prostitution first and then somehow got hooked into the addiction? But at this point, it doesn't really matter. When I'm meeting them, they have both addiction and they're, in, they're being trafficked. So um, I didn't realize that, but it makes sense. So um, I now realized that I was being asked to tear off a piece of the heroin crisis in our community. And if you had a chance to do something to help alleviate the heroin crisis in your community, wouldn't you do it? So that's how I felt too. I had never really thought that as a municipal court judge, I could really make a difference in that problem because I'm in municipal court, I deal with the lower level of crimes. So I see domestic violence every day, which I'm very passionate about that issue. That's for another day. Uh, and I deal with DUIs. But if you get a speeding ticket out here and you want to fight that, I could also be the judge hearing that case. So if someone is caught with heroin in their hand, possession of heroin is a felony. But if someone ODs and dies and has to be brought back to life with Narcan and all they're found with at the scene is the needle, the possession of that needle is a misdemeanor. So I would get those needle charges but felony judges also have a lot more resources than misdemeanor judges. So I was always frustrated. Well, whether you're charged with a misdemeanor needle or the felony possession, both layers of courts are dealing with heroin. And I'm really frustrated that there's nothing I can do about it. Well, here was my opportunity to do something about it, create a treatment program. So I, I said, I would love to do this. And uh, I went to our court administrator and said, what do you think about a human trafficking specialty docket? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Well, we looked online and lo and behold, there's a human trafficking specialty court right up the road in Columbus, Franklin County, Judge Paul Herbert, who's actually spoken to Empower You probably three or four years ago, because I came and heard him. Uh, so we went up the road several times, those two officers, an administrator type, <coughs> a person in our probation department who I'd sort of asked to, I kind of volunteered her to help. And we've been up several times up to Columbus and there he was doing it. And we checked the numbers to see if we had a big enough population to do it and we were off. And that's how Change Court started. I think it's kind of interesting that um, a citizens community group asked for help the police responded, came to someone they thought would be sympathetic, and we made it happen. Someone asked me the other day, actually a lawyer, well, you have a relatively low success rate in your court. Do you have any pushback from the police? I said, well, your definition of success and mine are different. If you expect a heroin addict who's making her living on her back, who's homeless, who's lost custody of her kids, who has other behavioral issues and mental health issues, and who has suffered trauma from head to toe to get through a two-year program of intensive supervision from A to B with no glitches, and then work in your skyscraper overlooking Great American Ballpark, that's not my definition of success. So for someone to agree to come into this program, that's a huge thing for someone who has no self-esteem doesn't trust themselves to follow a program, doesn't trust the system. For that person to say, I, I will try this. I'm tired of living this way. Um, that's a success right there. And every day of sobriety that they have is a success. And as for those police and their, their pushback, we have exceeded their wildest expectations. So let's talk a little bit more about, let's try and follow this a little bit. Um, you should probably know the legal definition of a sex trafficked person. Well, we went through all that. Those are my, my coordinator and my probation officer. Um, 
who are just, I couldn't do this program without them. So the Supreme Court actually calls us a drug court plus. So we offer all the services, support services and treatment services that a drug court offers, but that plus is the trauma because every traffic person has seen trauma. They've been raped, they've been beaten, um, and they were probably in trauma at the point that they entered into prostitution because most people who have good self-esteem and value are not gonna be lured into prostitution in the first place. So the people in my program all have suffered what they call, I'm, I'm not a sociologist, but in their vernacular, it's ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, they've all been molested, usually by the age of 13. Um, they've had no responsible people in their family. Um, they've been out on the street and um, it's kind of generational. Uh, they, they have not had solid upbringing with any structure in their lives. So um, trauma, we are a trauma-informed court um, and we are offering cognitive behavioral treatment. Uh, so um, it's a program of two years intensive supervision probation um, and it's voluntary. We accept men, women, and trans people. I have had one trans person in the program in five years. That person went AWOL, did not, did not make it, but we would take that person back and anyone else who wants to come into the program. Currently, uh, historically over five years, other than the one trans, everyone who's wanted the program is female, identifies as female. And it's probably easier at this point, five years into the program to keep it female, even though I would accept someone who's not female. But when they're talking about trauma in groups and in counseling and in court, I think it's probably more comfortable for women to talk amongst other women. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what a sex traffic person is. I'm gonna describe trauma and addiction, and I'm gonna put it all together for you because that's what change court is. So this is the definition of sex trafficking. Um, no person shall solicit another who is 18 years of age or older, because I only have jurisdiction over adults. It definitely happens to people younger than 18, but they would be in juvenile court. They would not be in my court. To engage in sexual activity for hire. And there's, of course, because we're lawyers, we define everything. So anything, an explicit or implicit agreement to provide sexual activity for anything of value. So it could be drugs, it's often drugs. Um, and then loitering to solicit is with purpose to solicit this um, sexual activity for hire. They are beckoning, stopping, attempting to stop another, engaging someone in conversation, stopping someone at a car. Um, so then of course, because we're lawyers, we define what a car is, <laughs> what a, a vehicle is. And then there's um, compelling prostitution. So that's what prostitution is. What does it mean to compel prostitution? Because that's the key to what we're doing, which is a trafficked person is someone who's been compelled. Lots of people think it's like in the movies where someone is kidnapped and taken to another country. Um, and that does happen. And we've seen it allegedly in the news very recently. It can also happen here domestically. Um, someone told me, at, someone in her church had a daughter who was on a college campus who was kidnapped and forced into trafficking. So that happens too. But the majority of the cases that I see are not anything that dramatic. Uh, it's compelling another to engage in sexual activity for hire. But note, under our state law, and this has been in effect since 2011, the element of compel does not require compulsion to be openly displayed or physically exerted. The element to compel someone has been established if the prosecution can prove that the victim's will was overcome by force, fear, duress, or intimidation. And that's what I see. And that's what people don't realize. It doesn't have to be a gun to your head or a knife to your throat. The compulsion can be much more subtle. And what I will see on a daily basis is someone who will tell the story. Um, uh, a 14 year old whose stepfather owned a bar 
and her mother let her go hang out at the bar at night. And mother didn't go. And uh, the 14 year old would chat up the patrons because they'd buy more liquor. And um, then the mothers, they would ask her to dance and mother said, sure. They're, they're buying more alcohol. Then they asked to take her home and mother said, sure. And stepfather said, sure. And then she was performing for them. Are you a traffic person? No, she said. And then she said, did my stepfather traffic me? Oh yes, and your mother did too. To have more beer sales in the bar, she would fit the definition of a trafficked person. Um, because she was 14, so her will was overborn. She didn't know any better at that age. I mean, no one forced her. No one held a gun to her. Uh, but that's how she got started. Over the time that I have known her, that woman has had her leg broken by her traffickers. Um, and she has many, many, many mental health issues. Um, interestingly, that definition of compel is similar uh, to the rape statute in Ohio um, to engage in sexual intercourse by force, threat, or compulsion. So a rape could be that someone's got you in a small room and you have no way to get out. That would be compulsion or a very big person with a very small person. Um, so it, it can be um, very subtle. And the other thing that I see almost daily is this type of story. My, I was molested by a male family member in my house. Um, no one believed me. They blamed me for it. I was sort of shamed in my house. And that person considered running away. They were out on the streets. Predators can sense that type of person a mile away. If they're in the mall, if they're at the bus station, and a predator will come up to a young person like that who has no self-esteem, who literally looks lost, say, would you like to come for dinner with me? Sure. And they get a nice dinner. Would you like to come home with me tonight? You are beautiful. You are so special. Has anyone ever told you you're special? Well, no, not, not in a long time. And what do I have to go home to anyway? So they go home, then they spend a couple of nights, they literally get wined and dined as teenagers. The man gives them drugs. They like the drugs. Somewhere down the road there, that man says, well, honey, someone's gotta pay for these drugs and this, these nice dinners. Can you help us? Can you help me pay for this? Some of my friends wanna date you. Do you have any problem with a date? They're my friends, they'll treat you well, we'll get money, I can keep you in drugs, I can keep you well fed. Sure, that's what you want me to do and you love me, I'll do anything for you. She's, she, she was groomed, just like a child molester was groomed. She's been groomed and so she has these dates with his friends and she gets that kind of Stockholm thing, like he still loves me though. Some nights he lies in bed with me and watches TV with me, just me. I know he loves me, I'm happy. Well, then there comes a day when he sends her out and um, he says, well, go into this abandoned building downtown, do your business, I'll be right around the corner with a gun and the money. <clears throat> if police come, cause a ruckus so they can chase you so I can get away with the guns and the money. Because if you get caught, you're gonna get charged with something like trespass or disorderly conduct. No one's gonna keep you in jail. There's no room for you in low level nonviolent offenders in jail. And I'll bail you out if you get locked up. So now she's getting those kind of charges on her record. One day she comes home and the guy says, you haven't brought home enough money yet. You haven't brought home enough money for dinner and you're responsible for dinner, go find dinner. So she goes and shoplifts steaks and Kroger's. Now she's got a theft charge on her record. And if she doesn't do it, she gets beaten. And um, these are the stories that I hear. That's the kind of compulsion that I hear. And oh, by the way, now they're hooked on drugs too. So that's the kind of trafficked person that I see. I don't have the foreign people. They have been arrested in Hamilton County. 
Um, they have been held and um, judges have given them high bonds to keep them in jail till they can get to me. And somebody comes and posts those really high bonds and they're gone. Those people are gone to another state. Um, the, the people of foreign, foreign nationals, we, we really don't get an opportunity to help them because no matter how high we post, we set a bond for them, somebody comes in and posts it. Um, the women that I see um, to get into the program because it has to be voluntary, they have to tell us, yes, I want, keep me in jail. I don't wanna be bonded out. I wanna stay to get this help. Uh, so that's the defi definition of trafficking. And then um, there's more trafficking in prison. So, so trafficking uh, shall knowingly recruit, lure, entice, isolate, harbor, transport, provide, obtain, or maintain another person. If the other person knows, the other person will be subjected to involuntary servitude or be compelled to engage in sexual activity for hire or in an obscene or sexually oriented or nudity oriented performance. Um, or if the person is less than 16, but I won't see those people under 16. Trafficking in persons is a felony of the first degree. So they are looking at a sentence of 10 to 15 years. Um, I don't, my court would not hear that that would be in the felony division of the courthouse. To be a trafficked person and to come into change court, there is no requirement that the trafficked person testify against their trafficker. So it's kind of a hybrid thing. A person charged with prostitution or theft that we know is a prostitute, they're a criminal, right? They've committed a crime in Ohio, but I'm treating them like a victim, a traffic victim. So it's kind of a hybrid. They're a defendant, but they're a victim too. And I put many conditions of probation on them, but testifying against their trafficker is never going to be a requirement. So there is the definition of sexual activity for hire. Um, that, that last slide uh, was interesting. Someone, not all the judges in Hamilton County, uh, that my 13 colleagues voted to approve change court. There were several that did not vote for it. Uh, they did not feel we had human trafficking in Hamilton County. That's Hamilton County. Those are uh, trafficked women. This was actually a, a sheriff's deputy. His wife was charged with trafficking in Hamilton County. Um, this one might, that might've been in Butler County. I'm not sure, um, but there, those are people charged with trafficking. That woman trafficked her daughter for heroin. She sold her daughter for sex for heroin. Um, people always want statistics. Um, 2017, the Ohio Human Trafficking Commission documented 208 potential trafficking victims. Ohio consistently has the fourth highest volume of human trafficking. And that comes from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. There's a website you can go to, Polaris, and you will see that there. Part of that is because of the highways, the interstate highways coming through Ohio. Uh, part of it might be, might be because it, it, more of it's reported here. I, I can't really tell you exactly why that is. Um, all my people were molested um, and they have been raped. And when they're raped, you think, did you tell the police? Why no, they say, who's going to believe a prostitute? Somebody's going to say it's a business deal that went bad, but they are very badly hurt in those rapes. And some have traumatic brain injury. I am told, we have a psychologist, a UC psychologist in our treatment team. I am told that the trauma that trafficked people face um, is exactly the same as the trauma that veterans face, PTSD. That's the level and the rate of trauma. All the people in change court have hep C, but none of them have HIV AIDS. Just a fact to report to you. Um, they all have chronic health care needs in, in change court because as you can imagine, when you're making your living on the street and you're getting high, you kind of neglect your physical needs as well as your mental health needs. So um, we have gotten um, full dentures for three people. Um, we've um, helped to arrange a hysterectomy for somebody. Um, we've all gotten them liver 
um, we've all got them into the liver, UC liver clinic. Um, they've gotten glasses. Most have been in treatment multiple times. If you Google change court, you will see the inquirer has covered change court graduations in the past. And one of our graduates, when she spoke in graduation, I hadn't counted. She said she had been arrested 87 times before coming into change court. And she had been offered treatment, but she had never stayed with it. ACEs, that adverse childhood experiences, they've all had multiple trauma. Um, there are many theories about why does this happen? Why is there addiction? Why is there trafficking? One theory, and I fully see it, is the root of addiction is a disconnection from self, family, and community. That trauma goes hand in hand with the addiction. That's what I see. And therefore, then, the only way to pull somebody out of addiction, in my experience, is incredibly intense personal connection with a person, which is what Change Court offers. So um, we offer all those services. We start with they're arrested on the street, and when the police bring them down to um, process them into jail, the people are told, hey, there's this kind of new program around. You might want to try it. The police call my coordinator who will come to the jail um, to talk to them about the program, say, do you just want to come watch? You don't have to commit to it because change, it has to be voluntary. Many, many will say no. And that's where that lawyer, the, for, the lawyer, Sonia, that I talked to you last week said, well, you have a low success rate. Many people will say no thanks because we're actually asking them while they're in, in withdrawal. And they just want to get back out on the street to get high again, to get back to what's comfortable to, for them, their comfort zone. They don't want to take the program, um, which is understandable. So, but some people at that stage say, you know what, I'm tired. I've OD'd seven times. I don't want to live like this anymore. I didn't think there was a way out, I'll, I'll try. And so those are the people that we get. And for those that we don't get into change court, I've asked my colleagues on the bench, if they ever come back to court and you see them, um, will you give them jail-based treatment? And when the, the fog starts to clear and they realize they're not getting out of jail, we'll circle back again and offer it to them again, and again, and again, and again. And that's why the idea of the plant was seemed appropriate because it's a program of second chances and fourth chances. I have a woman coming in to see me tomorrow who said yes at that early stage when she was arrested. And for her and for most of the people in my program, um, if you say yes, the first 90 days of the program, you're in jail. So that's kind of hard to say, uh, yes, sure, I'll stay for 90 days in jail. Who's gonna agree to that? But when they're in jail, they're in jail-based treatment. There's a separate building called, we call it 1617 Reading Road, but it's run by Talbert House, which is the biggest name in Southwest Ohio for treatment. So they're in a jail facility, but they are getting nine to five groups all day long. And then at night they're journaling, they can have visitors all under the jail guidelines. So they are in treatment. Several purposes for that. First is because if they tell me yes, they want help, and I let them out of jail, come back and we'll get you connected, they don't come back because the addiction pulls them back out into their bad habits. And they will say to me, don't let me out. I can't do this if you let me out. So that's one reason. The second reason is because all the treatment facilities that I partner with, if you go look at them, um, they are um, Cheney Allen, the Cheney Allen Crossroads Program, First Step Home for Women and Children, and off the streets. If you look at their individual programs, they'll all say requirements to come into our program, you have to be stable, mentally and physically stable. They will not take someone going through detox. So I have to get them detox before I can get them into any one of the residential treatment programs. And they're working with a case manager from Talbert House. So um, that program is 90-ish days. And then the last thing that's going on in those 90 days is I'm making a reservation for them in one of those treatment facilities because those treatment facilities are full all the time. So 
I have to say, can you hold a bed? We'll be needing a bed June 2nd. Can you hold one for me? And that's how I, I can get them a bed. Then they're never going to be homeless again. They're never going to be sleeping on the streets because um, my treatment team will meet them at the jailhouse door and drive them to their facility. So they're never going to be homeless again. So it's very intensive. Once they are outside um, in those treatment facilities, they're in groups, they're in individual sessions, and we have the, uh, the psychologist who's meeting with them. If they want medical, medically assisted treatment, known as MAT, uh, we will get that for them. <clears throat> it's usually Vivitrol in my program. Viv Vivitrol actually blocks our brain receptors so that humans do not crave heroin when they're on Vivitrol. So methadone and Suboxone are substitutes. Vivitrol just totally blocks your craving for it. And it's administered by a shot in your butt. And it's, its shelf life is about 30 days. So we have now gotten ourselves uh, coordinated enough that if someone wants that program while they're doing that 90 days in jail, the jail nurses will come over and draw those people's blood to make sure that their liver can tolerate the Vivitrol. And we will coordinate that shot for them the day or two before they're going to get released and driven to their treatment program. So then we have a 30-day window before they need their next shot. So when they walk out of jail, they're not craving heroin the minute they walk out. Um, that's voluntary. If they don't want Vivitrol, they don't have to. I'm, I'm not forcing meds on them. But if they want that, we can make that <clears throat> happen. Medicaid pays for that. Um, if they don't have Medicaid, private insurance will offer it at the cost of $1,500 a month. Um, there is a, um, I have to tell you this because I'm afraid I'll forget. One of the people in my program, she's living with her mother. I have to put a shout out to JTM Meets. The Moss family is incredibly giving to our community over on the west side. And they offer second chance reentry positions to many people coming out of incarceration and out of poverty. And one of my participants got a job there as a temp, and she was steady enough in her employment that they offered her full time employment. And she works at night, and she is making enough money that she's completely off government assistance. And that is a first for me. I've been around the courthouse in one form or another for 34 years. And to my knowledge, that is the first person that I've ever placed on probation who came into probation on government benefits and while on probation worked her way out of government benefits. Because I have seen it with my own eyes now. I'm not an economist. But I've seen it with my own eyes that the people who, in their later phases of change, they are working. We get them working and we get them housing but they're very careful not to work over a certain amount of hours or make a certain, over a certain amount of salary because they'll lose their benefits. And what happens? They are working more and taking home less. Where's the incentive for them to work? But this is a young woman now who's done it. We, we pushed her over the hurdle. Um, the one sticking point was that Vivitrol shot because now she's not eligible for Medicaid so $1,500 a month for that Vivitrol. But what we found, um, what my team knew, because I didn't know, is the active ingredient in Vivitrol is something called naltroxone, and that is available by pill um, for $30 a month. So we've got her switched from the Vivitrol shot at $1,500 to the naltroxone pill for $30. And she's making it. She was hoping to go car shopping this weekend. So to me, I'm, I, I'm so happy for her. Um, so, but we, we work very intensively. My probation officer and my coordinator are, are seeing them. Someone on my team is touching those people, whether they're in residential treatment and they're in groups or they're in individual sessions in their treatment facilities or they're seeing the psychologist up at UC um, or my, my coordinator and probation officer are taking them out for a meal or taking them to a doctor's appointment. We are seeing them every day. That's the level of intensity it takes to build up their self-esteem, their mental health, their physical health, to get them ready to go out into the real world. 
So talk about trauma a little bit. It's real that, you know, you have, we have changes in our brains when we go through trauma. Uh, and whenever someone is engaging in behavior that I don't understand in my treatment team, I just say, I know they're seeing these events through a trauma lens and I can't see what they're seeing. I mean, so it needs to be explained to me what's going on, but often someone will seem lazy to me. They don't want to get out of bed. They're depressed. They're making excuses for not getting up and going somewhere. And I always know it's trauma and the experts have to explain to me what it is. So there's the definition of trauma. This was put together for me, um, I believe by Dr. James Canfield, who's another psychologist up at UC. Um, it can be a single experience or it can be chronic exposure. Trauma is fairly common, but if it's not treated, it has long, long lasting um, impacts. These are all things that cause trauma. People don't often think of it that witnessing violence can, can be a basis for trauma. And we were talking about that this evening before the program began. Um, you can have secondary trauma actually. So I'm very aware with my treatment team that when we're hearing these awful stories that these participants have gone through, it's traumatic for us to hear it too. And we sometimes we just we need to process what we've heard too. Um, in domestic violence, a lot of my these women are the same women they've been victims of domestic violence by their trafficker as well. But I can always see, I'm always willing to see that a trafficker, as bad a person as they may be, or a batterer, they're probably a victim of trauma too, because this type of behavior is not normal for us. It's learned behavior. Just like I eat Thanksgiving turkey, I eat turkey. It's a learned behavior. And violence is learned too. We're not born being violent, right? So I always wonder whatever happened to the trafficker, that batterer in their childhood that caused them to create this type of pain and control um, towards someone else. Um, I've seen many, many times now, there's a video um, by Jane Sawyer who, who did a story on a, a middle-class woman in New Jersey. And one of her young sons actually filmed her husband berating her and eventually beating her. And the sons were like, yeah, mom, and you deserve that, and you deserve that. And she was literally so beaten down. And those children were victims. Their will was overborne by that overpowering father. And when I see those batterers in front of me, at least, I can see those are the children in Jane, in Jane Sawyer's video, that they saw this in their home, and that's why they think it's okay. I don't think it's okay. I don't address the traffickers. I deal with the trafficked. So trauma is an experience. Um, it is part of a person's experience. It will permeate every decision a person makes in their life. And it's related to nearly any negative outcome that adverse child experiences. Those are traumatic experiences. And those are, def those are examples of ACEs. Um, and sometimes in school, kids are asked these questions, which of these, um, which of these apply to you? Did you grow up in extreme economic hardship? Was there um, a divorce or separation? Someone in your family have an alcohol or drug problem? Did you witness violence? Were you a victim? Have you lived with someone who was mentally ill? Have you witnessed domestic violence in the home? Did you have a family member serve time in jail? Do you feel you've been treated unfairly due to your race? Do you have had a parent die? Um, it's pretty, pretty compelling stuff to, and when we're using the word trauma. You need to let me know if you have any questions because I can go on forever. Um, what is happening when someone experiences trauma? This is the medical response to trauma, that fight or flight. Um, it can lead to increased heart rate, blood pressure, mus muscle tension. Um, children who have been victims of trauma will test lower on standard testing. They'll have lower grades in school because they can't, it's PTSD, their brain cannot process what they've experienced and they get stuck. They can't move forward. And over time, it can lead to all kinds of um, ph physiological 
um, consequences. If you ever come to Change Court, you're welcome to come. As you might expect, the women in Change Court look much older than their chronological age. Uh, learned helplessness is a big one. They're conditioned to believe they have no control over a situation. They have trouble sleeping. Um, and part of that is from, at some point, that trafficker who wooed them in and told them, you know, you're beautiful, you're special, that at some point it's like, yeah, where's the money? And uh, you're going to get beaten if you don't bring the money. So they, I mean, who wouldn't feel helpless? Um, I see people come into change court and their feet are tapping. They just can't sit still. Um, they do have flashbacks. The people in my program have um, night terrors. They have flashbacks. They have triggers. Um, they can get irritable and they can engage in reckless behavior. So what we're dealing with is a combination of behavior issues and, and mental health diagnoses. So we're trying to change habits. That's the change in change, changing habits by showing them sort of reprogramming their brain. Their brain needs to reprogram, repair from the heroin. And it's not just heroin, I should say. I have um, people in the program who are alcoholics, who are crack heads, who use meth. Um, one of the women in my program, when she got really down on her luck, drank rubbing alcohol. These are actual changes in our brain um, based on trauma. And I, as I said, I'm told that veterans' brains look like that too. <clears throat> so we have all, all these things going on. You can imagine it's a really needy group to work work with. Um, it takes a lot of patience because they will do things that don't make sense to me, but for some reason make sense to them because I have to remember they are, they have been living their lives on the street. What they call survival to us looks a lot like manipulation. So sometimes it looks like they're playing one against the other. They're playing the team, the treatment team against the other. They're telling us slightly different things. Well, I mean, they survived on the street in that manner. So it takes a while to teach them something new. Um, some of them have traumatic brain injury. So this is what we need to worry about. This, this um, slide is in there because this program was originally, this presentation was originally created for mentors. Um, and um, that's one of the most recent pieces of Change Court. So I've got them coming in, I've got them in treatment, uh, everything's going well. Then when they get close to graduating, in the, so Change Court is actually in four phases, which is another Supreme Court requirement. So the first phase is very, very intense. They are in jail, most of them. Uh, and then I'm seeing them every week and no, you can't go to work and you've got to slow down. We got a lot of things to work on with you. But by the fourth semester of the program, I'm looking to get them out of the treatment program, treatment facilities and into their own housing and their own jobs to pay for their own housing and um, so we found as we try and give them more and more freedom, which is what they're working for and they really think they want, they get scared that we're not in this tight wraparound thing watching their every move anymore. They get kind of scared. So, but we need to push them out of the nest. So we finally, in the last year, were able to create a mentoring program. They all have sponsors in AA or NA, but a mentor is someone who's never been in addiction or recovery, just, a person because when I ask my participants go make healthy relationships well they don't know how to do that they've never had them not in their family um, everyone they meet is either in recovery or in addiction are we supposed to go out to the mall with a sign will you be my friend so we brought those healthy relationships to them we advertise for mentors and so now we have mentors who just an extra person to hold their hand. So to model for them what a healthy relationship looks like because they don't know. So what do, what is good, clean fun? They don't know. Well, what do you do after you work all day? Well, I don't know. I come home and I watch 
big bang theory. I mean, you know, they don't know, what do I do? So we have mentors trying to help show them that. And then we need to tell the mentors, you need to take care of you because you're hearing this stuff too. And it's, it's hard. So this is all to help um, the mentors. That's another part that we did, which was um, one of our first graduates, really cool story about um, two of our early graduates. One of them had been a hairdresser over on the west side. She had lost her license. She had stolen from people. And um, she was posting her progress on Facebook and her old manager saw her progress and reached out to her and offered her her job back. So now half the people in the courthouse go to her to get their hair done. Um, another one is working now as, as a night monitor at one of our facilities. She just came back to visit last week. Um, just they're very, very, very grateful. But when they graduated, we did an exit interview, like what are we doing wrong? You know, never done this before. We're kind of breaking new ground. We've had help up the street in Franklin County, but what, what, are we, what more could we be doing for you? And they said, how about fun? You know, you've got us in groups and you're watching us pee and we have to come see a judge every week. Where's the fun? Well, yeah, there's gotta be fun in life too. So um, we were able to connect with um, Lakeside Church in Lakeside, Kentucky, who was already taking all the women at off the streets over to their church. So they go there once a month for fun activities. And then every week when, before our docket starts, when the treatment team is meeting behind closed doors to talk about their progress, what message they want the judge to give this week. Our participants are in the courtroom doing fun things like yoga, they're doing martial arts. Um, they learn how to model, they've made beads, they paint rocks. You can Google change rocks and they paint rocks with uplifting sayings on them. And then there's a little sticker on the back that says, if you find this, um, take a picture of it, post it to our Facebook page, and then either keep the rock to inspire yourself or hide it somewhere else for someone to find. So we've been trying to do fun things with them. And of course the mentors are supposed to do fun things too. Um, this is all about heroin. I'm thinking by now everybody knows about heroin and about fentanyl and carfentanil, and there's probably more statistics in here. As you know, we're moving from heroin to synthetic opiates like fentanyl. It's very hard to understand that when we had that spike in 2016 on the west side where people were dying from fentanyl, addicts were running to that corner on the west side to get that good stuff. It's like, are you kidding me? It's killing people. Um, this is from Dr. Samarco's website. I was trying to get you the most recent statistics I could. Um, 15 babies born to heroin addicted mothers in the week of July 10th to July 16th, 2017. I can take women who are pregnant and in addiction. There's a, we have a really good program. I did not have anything to do with it. I just plugged in called the HOPE program, which is a program at Good Sam, which is our high risk um, hospital here, high-risk pregnancies, and first step home, so that a heroin-addicted mother, um, they'll give her methadone so the baby doesn't go through withdrawal, and then um, she gets all her prenatal care at Good Sam. The baby will be born addicted, and um, the baby will go through withdrawal in the hospital, and if the woman is, you know, depending on another court, not me, she may or may not get custody of her baby, but should she be allowed to have custody of her baby, she would be at first step home for women and children. I can, I can house that. I have had pregnant women in my program, when they're in jail, they've been unable to do the jail-based, Talbert House jail-based treatment program because they're taken out of jail up to the UC area every day for methadone. So they're missing too much of the program to be in the jail-based program. They're just in general population but I will keep them in jail to get that methadone every day till the baby's born. Um, Narcan, um, naloxone. Um, a lot of people have really you know, mixed feelings about that, but you're saving someone's life. And um, a firefighter once said, I judge if I have to make three OD runs with Narcan, I shouldn't have to go back a fourth time. That person shouldn't be allowed to live. I don't know how you feel about that. That doesn't seem 
a moral answer. That person is still someone's loved one. Um, but when they're in change court, they're not overdosing. They're not committing new crimes. So not only are we helping the people in change court, but we're helping give first responders some relief that they're not making that response. The police are not responding. They're not booking that person into jail. The jail is after that first 90 days is not having to deal with these people in jail because they shouldn't be in jail. They need treatment. Um, so um, there's a medically, medically assisted treatment that I told you about, Vivitrol. Um, with Vivitrol, um, they have to be, a person in medically speaking has to also be engaged in counseling because there's a real risk with Vivitrol because it blocks your craving, but someone could still have the urge to shoot up, like, like people giving up s smoking. They still want that behavior of smoking. So they have to be, um, they ha you have to watch to make sure that they don't try and shoot up because they will not feel it and they could die. We have a question here. Yeah. Judge, I've been messing with uh, dealing with the narcotics and drug business since I was dumping uh, antifreeze on marijuana plants and stealing reagents for making methamphetamines from drug dealers. I hate the bastards, okay? I, you have a community, I'll pose a scenario for you. You got a community. It's being confronted by a military formation. This military formation has men with small arms. They've got heavy weapons, artillery, intelligence, logistics, mechanized transport, communications, command control, and we got a judge and treatment programs. Do you get it? As I said earlier in the evening, I am pulling off one tiny corner of the heroin problem. That's a bigger problem and it's not what I'm equipped to do. I'm doing the best that I can with 34 years of knowledge in a very local court scene. To save one life is to save the world you can go deal with that armed militia who's coming at us. That's not, my, that's not my issue. I can't save the world. I can save one person. Well, the one thing I wanted you to understand is that narcotics and the human trafficking, slave trade and narcotics trafficking and uh, this sort of uh, illicit commerce has been going on throughout human history. Goes back to the Bible. But state sponsorship of this, are you familiar with an article in the really radical publication called Naval Proceedings? It's actually, it's actually published by the United States Navy out of, a, out of uh, Annapolis. Can't say I wet, read one publication from the US Navy in my life. <sighs> okay. I've been working on other things. Well, Can the, I get back to this? I can't solve that well, answer. The, the it's a very I, good the point issue. I want and I on. think that Empower You should have someone come in who can address that. I can only address what I can address, pulling off one tiny corner of the problem and a, and a human face to it. And that's what I can do. It's probably a good time for me to show you that video so you can see the human faces that I'm saving. Can you take a question while he's Oh, sure, that? yeah. I think I kind of missed it in the beginning, Judge, but when did you, how long is the program from start it's two years. It is. And okay, there's a reason right. for two that. years. Uh, the science of heroin addiction tells us that it takes a human brain two years to repair uh, and reroute so that one individual, not an army, can have an opportunity to live, to move forward for a lifetime of sobriety. That's the reason for the two years. Another question. It is a long time. I am proof that programs such as Change Court and Drug Rehabilitation Centers work for those who want change. I came into Change Court with nothing. No self-esteem, no relations with any family, no friends, no place I called home. Today, this addict that you fight for knows she is so much more than an addict. We wanted to inspire you as they have inspired me. Um, because they are our mothers and daughters and sisters and dog lovers. 
we wanted you to know they're more than statistics. And I think when they're telling you their stories, they're telling you that so that you know they're real people with real feelings and a real commitment. There's only three courts like this in our whole state. And so Judge Russell is a leader. I'm a big supporter of what you're doing here because I think it's clearly more successful than the alternative. I've learned many things through Change Court, but most importantly, I learned how to live and not just exist. I can honestly say that today, because of Change Court, I'm not only a productive member of society, but I want to be a productive member. I wanted to say, first of all, I'm grateful for Judge Russell for giving me the second chance at life. I got a great relationship with my mom and my two kids, and I never thought I would have that, and I do. Um, and, I'm, and I'm starting to love myself. Senator Portman, I would like to recognize and thank you for your extensive efforts to put a stop to the substance abuse and sex trafficking. More so, I would like to thank you for creating the anti-traffic laws in your investigation, which led to the closure of Backpage.com. It helped save me and can potentially save thousands of other women. I share all this with you because when, I, when you think of change court or rehabilitation centers or matters concerning addiction, I hope I come to mind that you were able to tell my story of recovery and be encouraged to keep fighting for us. Thank you. I've been asked um, when I came here, would it be possible to bring any of your uh, participants with you? And I don't like to do that to them. I don't like to parade them out like circus animals. Um, so this is the easiest way to do it. Um, that little snippet came, Senator Portman is very involved in the anti-human trafficking movement. He might be a good one. He might read the naval publications for you. Um, more, more involved with uh, national mat matters of national import. Um, but he, he wanted to see them, and so their prompt when they spoke to him was, tell them about you as people so that he wants to keep fighting for you. And that's what it was. So it's my chance for me to show you the face of a trafficked person in Hamilton County. Um, and so that's all that is to show you what they, what they look like. Um, they're beautiful. I can tell you about any one of them if you wanna know. One of them was that person who drank rubbing alcohol in her lowest moment. Um, one of them I don't think had her teeth yet. She's got the now, she's got a beautiful smile. Uh, the one who thanked Senator Portman for shutting down Backpage, she's the one off government benefits. Um, the, the first one who spoke, um, she's actually in the program coming up on three years. It's a two year program. How did she do that? Did she have a relapse? Because I, I will take them back. Uh, no, she's not relapsed once. She can't find affordable housing. Uh, she works full time at a fast food restaurant and was saving money. We were working with her on our budget. See, I'm working on local budgets. <laughs> and um, she had a couple of setbacks uh, without telling us she bought a car. So now we know, do not buy a car without us making sure you can afford it just like at home. Huh? <laughs> so, and um, but she had to pay off the car, so she got a little bit behind in saving. Her brother uh, is a vet, and uh, right before Thanksgiving committed suicide. She's from Boone County, Kentucky, and she now is a Sunday school teacher. She got a call at church that her brother had killed himself, and the first person she called was her probation officer. That's who she, that's how, enmeshed, entrenched, if you will, with them, we are, um, for, for support. And then she wanted to do something at Christmas to honor her brother. Well, then her sister is in the Kentucky Penitentiary for drugs. And in Kentucky, they will allow you to come to your family's funeral if the family pays for the transport. So she paid for that, and she paid for the funeral. So she's a bit behind in saving for rent, but we're, you know, we're hopeful. And we, of course, now realize well, now we know why you were with us for an extra year so that you were with us when this happened so that we could be with you to support you through this. So a, she's able to see it that way. We have a couple of questions. Hello, I just wanna thank you for all the work that you are doing. It's thank beautiful you. to see. 
Um, I, I do have a couple questions. Uh, Rob Fortman said there were three of these mm -hmm. change courts. Where are the other two? Um, well, actually, there's four now. I'm the third. The first was Franklin County, um, a judge in Cuyahoga Municipal Court in Cleveland got, even though I started before her, she got herself certified before I got mine certified. And the fourth one I just found out about is in Akron, Summit County. And I'll tell you how I found out that there's now a fourth one. Last week we were, well, I got an email. I did get an email. And then last week I saw on the news that our new um, Attorney General Yost was freeing up money um, to help traffic victims who have been tattooed because often their traffickers brand them. And he freed up money to four counties where the four human trafficking specialty dockets were to provide for the removal of the branding tattoos. Okay. And then, the, and then uh, I'm assuming that these change courts are the same. Well, to, to a great extent they are. I am completely modeled after my now mentor, Judge Herbert, in okay. Franklin County, but every county, as you can imagine, if you go from, you know, Forest Park to Springdale, every little municipality, so every county, from county to county, our resources vary. Okay. So Judge Fra in Franklin County, their program differs in this way. Franklin County had more jail space and less treatment beds. Hamilton County, as we all know, never has jail space, but we had relatively more treatment space. So his, his, participants can sit in jail for up to six months before there's a treatment bed available. Mine are out in 90 days. Okay, and your rehabilitation centers that you send them to, are they all in Hamilton County? They are all in Hamilton County, and um, all the people, well, except for one this week, all the people in my program committed a crime anywhere in Hamilton County. I would not have jurisdiction as a Hamilton County Municipal Court judge if the crime that they committed had not occurred in Hamilton County. So at the time they're coming into my program, they're considered Hamilton County okay. residents, except I, just this last week, the first time ever, I got a transfer of supervision from Butler County. Okay, that's why I was wondering, where did the Butler County people go? They do not have a change court in Butler County. However, you have a wonderful judge in Butler County named Joyce Campbell. Um, she actually has a mental health court docket. Uh, so she's my colleague in Fairfield, and um, she's actually the president of the National Alliance for Mental Health and Illness. So she's very tuned into this, and we got word that there was a, a person sitting in her jail, the victim of, who had shoplifted at Kohl's. I'm sorry. This is, this is really my original question, and I don't know exactly how to ask this. I am aware that there is a possibility of at least one rehabilitation center whose owners or, or proprietors uh, have another purpose other than to rehabilitate mm. back into the community, mm -hmm. but more in, back into or into their community. Is that a possibility? And, and are you aware of that? And it, so you're sort of saying bad people. Is that what, is that what I'm hearing there? They I'm are in a people with bad ulterior yes. motives, not necessarily bad I'm people. very much aware of that going on in Florida, that there are treatment facilities who, and you can go online and find it, that um, you know, families are trying to do the right thing and they're sending um, family addicts down to Florida and it's a huge money-making thing and they're not being helped at all. I'm not aware of Ohio, but you know, there's good and bad people everywhere, but I know Florida's got a bad reputation for that. Whatever, what, you know, I'm, I'm open. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mel, and I think you started to answer the question, but I just wanna make sure under certain circumstances, you can assist or take over cases from surrounding counties. Is that what I'm understanding? Just for the very first time, having started this program five years ago, the same police that asked me to start this program called me up. I should not take their calls anymore. They <laughs> called me up and said, Judge, we got a call from a woman sitting in Butler County Jail on Fairfield Municipal Judge Campbell's sentence for shoplifting. She's told the jailers out there, please, please don't let me out early and I don't want to 
there's stuff still pending, but could we help her? Well, I know Judge Campbell and I know her heart. I will ask. And she allowed me, so it's the first time that I've transferred supervision from a, a judge, an out of county judge. But I will tell you, um, one of my, uh, she's in that film. Um, I have a woman who came into my court with a domestic violence charge against her sister. Well, you're never thinking of prostitution with a domestic violence charge against your sister. But I sent her for a court clinic evaluation just to see what would make her allegedly slash at her sister with a knife because most healthy people don't do that. And the, do the doctor, the court clinic doctor called me and said, Judge, she's describing dancing and being in an escort service would that qualify? Yes, under our definition of Ohio's definition of, of being trafficked, it would. And she came into the program. Well, once we took her into the program, you know, people don't always, they're a little bit protective of themselves. They don't know what to share. She says, we didn't run a record. Now we know, run their out of state, run their out of county record before you take them in to see if there's something else pending. She had a pending felony drug charge in Butler County Common Pleas Court. So I contacted um, Judge Pater and said, here's, she sits with me in treatment. Um, she wants to turn herself in on your open warrant and she wants to stay in treatment here. What do you think? And he said, if she shows up, if you can get her to my court in Hamilton uh, in the morning, um, I will recall the warrant, I'll give her an OR bond. And eventually, gave her treatment in lieu of conviction, the treatment being have to stay in change court for a year. Now my program's two years, but he only required her to verify that she was in ongoing treatment for a year. And he told her, if you do that, um, the charge will be dismissed. So I have been able to work with Butler County that way. I've had extremely good fortune with um, Northern Kentucky judges where a lot of my people had open warrants. We found out they had open warrants. Same thing, getting those judges to recall the warrant just recall the warrant. They want to come and turn themselves in. They'll take your sentence. Please take it into consideration. This intense supervision, we're getting them. Um, but, you know, that's part of someone in addiction going through a 12-step program to make amends. They want to get this behind them and take responsibility. I wish I knew his name because I'd give him a shout out. But a judge in Northern Kentucky said, yes, I'll recall the warrant. Yes, I'll give her an OR bond. Is she really doing that well? Okay. And, and he dismissed the charges. He said, will you give this to her like a diploma? Okay. And the next part of my question is too long for you to answer here. I understand that. But what more do you need in the arsenal? Decent housing. Um, when they graduate from my program, I'm able to expunge their records. So they don't have that, that as an obstacle but they are not making enough money that they can afford decent housing. The housing that they can afford are in the parts of town where nobody wants them to go back to those parts of town. So I need that. Um, and therefore I need them to connect to better paying jobs. But the trend is growing in Hamilton County of corporations giving these people second chances, which is again, the reason for the plant. So new life, they're being given second chances, not enough. Um, but I, they need better job opportunities so that I can get them really decent housing because they, oh my gosh, two year commitment. It's a huge commitment for someone who has coming to me with nothing, not even trust in themselves. And when they make it through my program, you know, they deserve something nice. So that's what we're still looking for. That's You've given us uh, a lot of information about the starfish, and thank you very much. But uh, what about the traffickers themselves? And I ask because you hear in the news about the Johns, you hear, I mean, you talk about the, the prostitutes. I almost never hear about the traffickers. Well, again, um, a human trafficking charge, a prosecution would be brought at the felony level because it's a serious crime. And I'm at the lower tier of cases, so I, it's not my focus. They are, um, they, there are investigations, those two officers that are still calling me. Um, they are involved in those investigations. Um, and as you can imagine, um, 
trafficked people are reluctant to come to court to testify against the people that hurt them. So it's very hard to get witnesses. It's hard to put that case together because it's kind of like a conspiracy charge. There's usually an enterprise of a trafficker and there's a whole structure of in a, and so there's a long, they are, believe me, there are ongoing investigations. A lot of them are taken at the federal level here and there are some at the state level, but they're very, they're long-term investigations. And then even once you've put all the spokes in the wheel of a conspiracy, you have to have willing witnesses. And remember, I've told you, I don't make my trafficked people testify. If they want to, well, they'll be a lot stronger witness than they would be if they weren't in change court, but I don't make that a condition that they do that. But that is going on and I can't speak to it because I'm not deep in the weeds with that part, but it is going on. Um, and there are lots of um, foreign trafficking situations in Hamilton County. It is, I mean, I've, I've heard this now from the police. There will be, if you go to a nail salon and the manicure is too cheap to be real, it's too cheap to be real. Those people are here against their will. They've been somehow brought here. They can't speak the language. Um, so they're isolated in that way. And the police will watch. They, there may be beds in the back of the, of the salon and they're taken back to a home. They all live in the same home. They're never left alone. Even to walk around the house, there's someone with them. They're taken at a certain time to go shopping and never left alone. And even if they were left alone, they cannot speak the language. Those are really hard cases. You know, you think of, I think of police as saying, well, there's John and there's Susie because they don't know their names, but they're trying to take pictures of them and put the pieces together of a human trafficking. It's a very hard case to do, but it does happen. And occasionally you'll read about it. And occasionally you'll read about, um, there was a bus in a Blue Ash Hotel. There's been bus in Springdale and Sharonville. It does happen. Um, I live in Loveland. There's been a whole big dust up about something going on in Loveland. It's hard, they're hard cases to prove. Maybe I've just broadcast something I shouldn't, I don't know. But they're out there, I can't speak to them. I, I know the police are aware of them. Um, I don't know if you know that now, but all cosmetologists who are licensed um, and have to go through continuing education as anyone who holds a state license does, part of their continuing education hours is in sex trafficking and labor trafficking because it is that prevalent. We've got time for one more question. Um, so if at any point, um, is there any point in the program where they teach like employable skills for the- Yes, the great question. See, that's why I wanted you, cause I, I won't get to everything. Um, so as I said, we're in the fourth semester is pretty much the fourth semester is that let's get you ready to get out there in that big cruel world. And um, we have great um, services in Hamilton County. There's something called City Links, um, which is down in the West End. And I just had a young woman go through City Links in the last two weeks, a job readiness training program where she learns hard skills and soft skills like people skills. So she learns how to deal with her own trauma if she's working somewhere and somebody looks at her funny or somebody says something to her she doesn't like, so she doesn't explode. So she's getting that kind of job training. They do interviews with her. They do kind of like American Idol um, job interviews with her. And she was offered her first job. Listen to what it is. It's working three days a week, picking up trash on the highways for $50 a day. And she is over the moon thrilled. And she said, I'm ready to start Monday. And I'm like, hold on, you always want things faster than I'm willing to give it. You cannot put your work ahead of your sobriety. When are you gonna to get to your group meetings? When are you gonna to get to your individual meetings? When are you gonna get up to UC to Dr. Espinola? <clears throat> Let's make sure you're fitting those in. And we did. We were able to work around that three days. So tomorrow I will hear for the first time how that first week is. But they do, we've also, we were connected, um, the YWCA had a, pro a program with City Links called First Course <clears throat> Front of the House, offered at the Duke Convention Center, where they learned um, <coughs> food service skills. And it's a nine week program, it was offered four hours a day, twice a week for nine weeks. And at the end of the program, they have to take a test and then they get a certification like the one you get from Cincinnati State from that really great culinary school we have at Cincinnati State, which will be recognized by any restaurant 
in the area. Um, we had people working there from Via Vitae. We had people there at Starbucks. Um, they learned how to set a table. They learned how to serve. They learned how to host us. Um, we had a bit of a bump with them when they had to learn wine tasting and beer because they knew they couldn't, they couldn't do that. But they, had to, they were tested on it and they, they got through it. They didn't taste it, but they had to learn about it. So we do have um, good job training opportunities. A lot of them don't even have a high school diploma. So we've had them going through GED. Um, one of the women up here just um, is connecting to the, it's called 22, I think, 20, the 22 plus program, which for us is offered at Dawn Community High School up towards downtown where she will go back and get her transcript from Taylor High School, which is where she was. And then all she has left to do is they will teach, they will work her towards the missing credits from her high school. So she'll actually have a diploma, not a GED. So we are working on very much job and education training because I'm trying to set them up for life. You know, a heroin addict, if I put them on probation for four months, some of them could do that standing on their head and say, yay, I'm success. What have I taught them to go forward for the rest of their lives? So we are trying to teach them those skills that they can stay sober we have, um, we have a lawyer from um, Legal Aid and one from Ohio Justice and Policy who are working on federal grants to help victims of human trafficking with their civil issues. So they may owe child support, they may have arrearages on their phone bill or utility bill, they may have lost custody of their children and those people can help them say, I've done this tremendous program can I have visitation with my kids? One of them, one of the women in that program, she's one of my graduates, she now has custody of her kids back. Uh, so we're, we, we offer all that other stuff. Once we get through, like, let's keep you alive till tomorrow and get you a place to sleep tonight. In the fourth semester, we are working on those things. I hate to bring this class to an end. Do you have any final thoughts that you um, want to give? You know, I wish I did. If I, let me see if there's anything else. Thank you for your interest. I can't, you know, um, we're doing the best we can. I think, I think this program uh, shows there are a lot of good people out there trying to help. A lot of us, like me, thought, what can I do? This problem is huge. Um, so this is one personal response uh, to a program. There's a lot of people out there that want to help. Uh, and, you know, what can you do? So housing, um, jobs. Always looking for mentors, um, not necessarily a plug, but we're always looking for people who say, how can I help? I can't, you know, I don't have a lot of these skills, but um, the mentoring program is big. Um, I, I'm trying to send a message, something good happening for these people who have been overlooked for a long time. I can't solve all the world's problems. I can't personally stop. The, the importation, the importing of fentanyl, um, but I can, I can save a life today, and, and that's enough for me, so thanks. Yeah. That was very enlightening and informative, and Judge Russell, thank you so much for thank coming you. tonight, and please be careful going home. Yeah. Thank you for what you do. I'm not in the addiction.